let's continue with uh, the RDS session. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. So in the previous uh, hour, we talked about the the instance particularly, right? Including the engines and the additions, um, the common and the dedicate, those kind of concept. So now let's look into some even uh, more specific features of the Alibaba Cloud RDS. And uh, now you are looking at uh, something, if you are running a database related service, you cannot skip or you cannot uh, just uh, ignore them. First one, backup. Backup means you need to have your data you know, stored somewhere. And in the future, you can recover for something was happening. And uh, we also need to monitor and keep the data secure, right? This is something you cannot avoid. And uh, sometimes you want migra migration data in and out. So all these kind of uh, things I'm going to introduce um, quickly in the following session. Uh, remember, go back to the RDS console. Let me pick up just one uh, MySQL and the example. If I already have the RDS instance created, and this is a HA session, a HA addition. So it has a primary instance. I go inside and uh, you can see, we have this configuration showing somewhere. I remember it should be somewhere. Um, where is my config? This, this is, should be, oh yeah, oh, sorry, this one. This is a high uh, availability addition, right? Uh, which means I have a master and a slave and only the master is working at the same time. Um, what I will show is the, from here, the backup and the restore. If you want to backup a database from cloud, from Alibaba cloud, the first thing you need to do is click the backup instance button and we give you two choices, the physical, and the logical, right? The physical and the logical, what does that mean? What is the difference between the physical and the logical? I'm going to show you on this picture. Okay, so physical means they will majorly copy the file system level files directly to a backup file. And the logical backup usually means they need to go into your database inside to look into the schema, look into the table, look into the data in the table and use some kind of uh, interactive active tools uh, to grab the data out and put it into the data into the data file. And later on, if you want to restore, we will replay those kind of data and reinsert those data into a new database or existing database. Okay, so physical and the logical, uh, they are quite different. So usually physical is much faster because they grab the files directly and put it in the package. And later on, they just restore the, all the files and make, it, make the whole database back. And the logical usually suitable for the smaller database. And uh, uh, you can think about something like the MySQL dump. Those kind of tools is the purpose for the logical backup and the re recovery. Okay. Yeah. And uh, another thing you can see is here, I, if I have some data already backup, right? So it is a physical backup and you can download it, right? So download means you can grab it from Alibaba Cloud and put it somewhere you think it's safer or you think it's cheaper. So it is another functionality we provided. So it's showing in the slide, we have the download feature and uh, regarding the pricing, uh, we have a rule that if your backup data capacity or storage space didn't exceed half of your purchase instance storage size. For example, if you buy uh, uh, RDS with one gigabyte uh, storage capacity, uh, not right. So five gigabytes is the minimum, right? If you have a five gigabytes RDS, so we give you 2.5 uh, gigabytes free storage to store your, uh, store your backup files, right? Once you exceed this, you may delete some, you may um, put them uh, to some other cheaper storage like the, the OSS, okay? And if you want to restore, you can restore individual database, right? Uh, you can just pick up a typical one and uh, we will uh, also tell you, okay, which uh, exactly table you want to restore. 
and you click OK, you will do the restore. And also you can restore the data to the particular instance, right? This is called the clone instance, which is a temporary instance. You can restore all the data to the temporary instance and uh, do not impact your major product environment. And then later on, you can just using some data synchronization mechanism to sync the data back to your primary RDS instance, right? So that is a two way we provide for you to consider how can you do the backup and restore. Okay, so here are the, the PPT. And uh, now we are talking about, we, we already know how can we do the backup and restore, but the key point is we do database backup and restore. We are facing something is more, sta more static, right? You have some backup data and the database is broken. You bring it back and you do the restore. This kind of operation is not business continued, right? It is a kind of static way. <clears throat> uh, the bring the backup file back and restore may take, you know, minutes or even even uh, I don't know hours, right? So your, your business has to stop there. We have. A, Usually the customer may have another think that how can I make the business running continuously? Remember yesterday regarding the SRB, we give you a two scenarios, which is a multi-zone disaster tolerance, right? We have another one is called the cross region disaster tolerance. But I, I did something very, uh, you know, I didn't mention the database part in that two scenarios, right? If you remember that I talk about SRB, I talk about the ECS, I didn't talk about RDS at that time, but today, since you know what RDS is, I'm going to talk about RDS now, right now uh, regarding the disaster recovery scenario. Here, I'm showing you two regions, region one and region two. And in each region, you have two zones, the zone A and the zone B, right? If, you, if your boss wants you to set up a so-called disaster recovery architect, what you want to do is you set up two different you know, resources. In the zone A, this is your production environment, right? This is your production environment and uh, you need to have some ECS here, right? And uh, Maybe on the outside, you have a SRB or something, all right? So you have ECS here, but be careful. There's no ECS here, right? There's no ECS here. And you have ECS here. Your ECS will talk to a particular RDS instance in the region A, uh, in the region one. And this RDS instance, we master set it, set it and uh, HA addition, which means it has a master, it has a slave, right? And I put master and slave into AZ to make sure it is HA. Um, the master keeps syncing data to the slave, which is uh, transparent to the customer. And if you want to do the backup, just and the previous slide shows, you can keep enable the automation backup policy and keep backup and maybe put your backup file in the OSS, right? For data uh, persistency. And uh, uh, just give you a quick note, heads up. This SRB is not a typical uh, standalone SRB. This SRB is using inside the RDS uh, for the traffic distribution, okay? Uh, together with something called the power proxy. Now you have this RDS setup, but you are looking for a cross-region disaster recovery, which means you have a strong desire or strong requirement to keep syncing the data here to the other region, right? What can we do and how can we achieve that? So we have to introduce you another product in Alibaba Cloud called the DTS. And the DTS is data transmission service. It can support three major function. Uh, the first one is migration. The, data, the second one is data synchronization. And the third one is data subscription. Um, so let's forget about this too, but majorly focus on uh, the data synchronization. So if you enable this feature with the proper configuration on both source side and the destination side, 
which means on the destination side, you should have another RDS instance uh, up and running, right? Usually the same configuration and the same setup. And you use the DTS to create a continuously data sync up channel uh, from here to here. The channel could be express connection, uh, could be our CEN, right? Because those kind of choices will make the cross region traffic and the bandwidth uh, bigger and faster. With this kind of setup, you can um, keep working and keep pro provide a service on the, re on the region one and every persistent data will be stored in here and be synced from here to here, right? So by doing this, everything, every data you, you grab here will be shown also on the region two. So now you can, together with the previous scenario we, we talked about in the SRB, uh, you can begin to imagine uh, when, the disaster when the disaster is happening, what will happen to my architect, right? Now you can see, let's assume all this region is broken, right? If all this region is broken, my question will be, my question will be how fast you can recover your business in region two. Can someone give me a, a assumption of how fast? I mean, how fast you can recover your whole business, right? Your service, not only the data, the data is always there, right? How fast you can uh, recover your whole business in the region two and uh, what is the major factor to impact your speed? Okay, is my question clear? Okay, great. You see someone says three, 30 minutes, uh, 30 seconds. Someone say one hour. Um, so can you give me some hints about what kind of, uh, you know, uh, major factors you are consider is the time difference. Why someone said 30 seconds? Why someone said one hour? For, for, for NER, uh, you said one hour, um, why you think you need one hour? But I prefer, I, I would like your question actually. 30 seconds is too fast. <laughs> I mean, this is the concept of the IPO, remember? And ITO. If you know the term, this is a typical term regarding to the disaster recovery uh, scenarios. The IPO is recover point objective. The RTO is recover uh, time objective. Okay. So recover point objective is majorly talking about the data uh, time point, which means if you have something here, okay? If you have something here already stored, but you need to sync the data to another destination like this one, right? How fast the data is synced will, will wholly impact this IPO number. Let's say if you want to make the IPO equals zero, IPO equals zero means whatever happened, whatever happened here, I can always have the similar data in the history any any moment. I can have it. That is IPO, the recovery point, which means I can recover to, to every minute, every second in the history, right? So make the IPO point is zero. If there's no difference. Zero means no difference. But this is a very, very ideal situation, right? Because the data synchronization always depends on how fast your data synchronization channel could be. If the channel is not good, if the channel is fast, is, is lazy, is kind of a lot of latency, the IPO cannot be zero. IPO could be five seconds, could be one minute, because when data was here, they spend one minute to be transferred here. But suddenly, if the data was broken here, maybe you can only get one minute ago data, right? 
because when the data was broken, you still have only one minute ago before. You never have the real real time data because the transaction has a latency. That's the idea of the IPO. But what is the ITO? ITO is something called the recover time objective, which means if something was happening here, your customer, this is a customer point of view. Your customer will feel the failures. They will feel that your service is not responding. Then the ITO will, uh, the, the number will, will say how many, how long you may recover to your normal status, which means how long the customer will wait here and keep trying. And finally, maybe after 30 seconds, maybe after one hour, they found the service is back. That is your RTO, recover time objective. Okay, so now you know in this whole scenario regarding the disaster recovery and your business service, the IPO is based on the data, trans data synchronization channel speed, right? But ITO is based on how redundant your resource is in this region. And I said, in this region, you don't have what? You don't have ECS, right? And you don't have SRB, right? All these kind of services, when something was happening here, they need to be prepared from ground, from scratch, right? So the question will be, the ITO is totally based and decided and defined by how fast you can build ECS here, you can build SRB here, and you can connect your ECS to the database, and you can connect the SRB to the DNS, and finally make the whole architecture working in the new region. Okay, so someone said 30, minutes, uh, 30 seconds, someone said 15 minutes, someone said one hour. They are all right answer because we may not know exactly how fast you can recover with the whole architect, including the ECS build up, including the SRB build up. But we definitely know if you can put something always there. For example, you can have some running ECS stay here and even they don't do anything because if this one is still alive, you don't need to do anything. You can keep a, you know, SRB always there, right? It is a money, it's a very money cost. It is not very, you know, economic efficiency, but it will make your recover time faster because when something was happening here, you don't need to build your ECS. It's already there. It's already there. You just do the configuration and the redirect. The, you don't need to do the redirect. The ECS can always point to this RDS. Then your recover time could be 30 seconds, right? Right, um, okay. So now you get the idea of the IPO and ITO, right? So IPO, recover point objective, which means how fast you can sync the data, right? And the ideal IPO is zero. And the ITO means how fast you can recover your business, which means you need to think about how many redundant resources I put it here and how many I should make them alive. And when something is happening, I can switch over as much as I can. Okay. Hopefully, I use this picture can give you a, a basic understanding about the backup and the recovery. And later on, in your own uh, data center, your own IT infrastructure, you can uh, always keep this two major, you know, matrix uh, in your mind. Okay. Um, Besides the data recovery, we have another very interesting scenario uh, can be used or applicable in RDS. It's called the read-only instance. Uh, from the name, we can tell it sounds like this instance only can serve the read request, right? And the picture show we have the capability to give you to just like the console shows. Um, I'm going to go back here. See, we give you the capability to create something called the read-only instance. 
right? You can create directly from here. And then usually I remember you can create uh, the maximum like file with the only uh, instances. Why we need this? Because usually in the e-commerce and the website kind of uh, scenario, uh, write and read, this two kind of IO is not balanced. Uh, think about your wife or your girlfriend, or I mean, I, there's no, no, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm just taking an example. Uh, even take me an example. When I go to some e-commerce application or the website, I keep, I keep navigating, right? I never make the real order until I found the, the proper uh, price and the proper, you know, functionality one, I may make the order. It means I spend maybe 80% of my time just watching, just reading, right? Just getting data from the database. But I may only take, you know, 10% of my, uh, my time to really write an order into the database. So the read and the write actually is not balanced. It's like, um, the, so the very famous 80, uh, 20, you know, rules or principles. So we give you the capability, you can just create more read-only instance to handle the 80% read request and just keep the master instance to answer the right instance, right? It is a very interesting configuration. Um, but at the same time, when you bring in the read-only instance, you may bring in your new trouble, which is you have more than one instance now, it is a similar problem and the SRB we were facing, right? SRB need to handle a lot of backend servers. They have the different IP address and each of these instance, even if it is a read-only instance, they have the different access point. But to the customer, again, they don't want to care about the difference. They, they want to have a unified access point. And then in the RDS, we have a very similar, you know, configuration is called the read, write, splitting. That is a unified access point. You can use it to manage the, the, the backend read-only instance and the master instance and provide a unified, we call it the read-only splitting, uh, sorry, read, write, splitting address to the customer. Okay. So that is uh, something here. You see in the RDS, we have a one called the read, write, splitting, right? So you can create a read-only instance, then uh, here they will ask you to create a read-write splitting address if you want, so that they can have a you know, centralized entry, an enter, an entry point for the RDS. Okay. Um, okay, now you know what is the RDS is, right? And uh, ECS can talk to the RDS to grab data. We call it the structural data or structured data. But sometimes ECS think this kind of data access is not fast enough because the RDS is supported by some cloud disk. Those cloud disk has a limited IOPS, right? Uh, for the gaming or some other uh, you know, promotion day for the e-commerce website, this kind of speed is still not enough. So they were thinking maybe someone can sit in the middle between my ECS and RDS can be working and a catch to accelerate my data access. So Alibaba Cloud has RDS and the memory catch to play a role for the data catch. Why they are faster than RDS? Because uh, RDS memory catch, they were using the memory, the server's memory and their major storage. You know, memory, is much faster, even 100 times faster than the disks. So the RDS will have the data catched here and uh, the RDS will grab data from, uh, uh, sorry, the readers will grab data from RDS. So next time, if the same data was asked, the RDS will only respond directly from itself, from the catch pool, right? We'll make the data access much faster. And later on, I'm going to introduce the OSS, which is the unstructured data, okay? So that is the three major um, difference between RDS, the catch service, and OSS.
what is the answer? Sorry, so no fires. So which question you are asking? What is the answer? I, I don't know which question you are asking. Okay, now let's go into the go to the console uh, for the final demo. Um, you see, now I have the RDS here, right? So I can go to the RDS, um, uh, the major basic information. Uh, the first thing you think you, you may pop into your mind is how can I log into my my database, right? So every RDS they have provide you two endpoint, which is access point. We have a public public one. We have an internal one, right? The the public one it can be accessed from the internet. The internal one can be visited from the in some internet uh, in the database in the in the VPC, and. Um, Alibaba Cloud also provide you an even better way to visit your database. So which is you can log on to your database through our another service called the RDS, uh, sorry, called the uh, DMS, DMS, Data Management Service. Which, which means you don't need to have some command line based uh, circle client installed. You can just rely on our uh, DMS service to be able to visit the database from uh, from the browser. Come on. This is from my. Let me uh, use another browser. Okay, and I said you can either using the circle client to visit this endpoint, and also uh, the account. Uh, please allow me to introduce more. So you can create your database access account from here. When you create an account, it could be a privileged account or standard account, right? Privileged account means it can do everything. Standard account usually they need to give you uh, give them the different uh, authorization to the different database or tables. And even you can see uh, and create the database from here, right? Um, so all this information you can be find from this logon to DB console. Let me try if this browser can work better. Okay, it works better. You can see in this console, we call them the data management service. It has um, all the instances you can manage from here. And if you go here, you can see I have one, one uh, instance already logged in. And uh, you can also using the different database can be shown here. And you see, right? I see a, I see a table here. And uh, in this table, I have three columns and the name select, right? Um, see, I can execute some circle command from the control panel. And uh, because I know there's a table in this Database is called a friend. I can select everything from the friend, which was uh, some random data I inserted before. Um, I may not spend too much time on this tool, but I would say DMS is something you should know in the future. If you use Alibaba Cloud RDS um, and you want to have a very reachable uh, operation capability, uh, DMS is your first choice because from here, as you saw, you can select, oh, sorry, you can execute. Uh, the circle command directly from here, and you can do the data import, right? And also you can do the database export, and you can do uh, some uh, instance related configuration. And uh, also there's something called the, uh, let's see here. 
uh, even the operation audit, right? You can find out the previous operations you have done and the, the command you executed. Um, I have, I remember I have another, there are also some other functions like you can use these tools to generate some test data. Uh, if, you, if you have thousands of the, uh, you need to create millions of the data, right? To fill into the database, you can use our tools to create uh, them just automatically. It is very, uh, very, very useful. So through this demo, I want to show you that uh, no matter monitoring or uh, some other data management you can always achieve from the DMS. And the last thing we want to mention is this one, the security. Data security is very important to whatever you put your data in, in the cloud. And it's not basic. We have this protect not only for SLB, but for also for RDS. And uh, if you use our wolf, uh, something like the circle injection or brute force attack can be fully coveraged, covered by the wolf. And then naturally we have a feature called IP whitelist. This is something you should know because if you go back to the console, there's a security um, menu here. That this is a whitelist. Whitelist means Right, you need to grant, you need to put the particular IP address in the whitelist, then that client can access your database. Otherwise, no matter whatever other things you do, you cannot visit. So whitelist is a very strict security policy. Remember in the future, if you see my client cannot log into the database, the only thing, and uh, sorry, the first thing you need to check is here if your client IP is in the whitelist. Okay, remember that this is very important. And uh, also we have, uh, our, we talk about the backup, right? And uh, uh, this is database connection. Um, and I, this is a default portal, uh, I think it's okay. And uh, for the proxy uh, in MySQL, you can create a dedicated proxy to provide a better, better uh, visit performance for your backend uh, uh, master and slave node. And you can use the redress splitting, right? And here is a monitoring for your proxy uh, resource usage. And the monitor and the alert, these are all the uh, metrics coming from the cloud monitor. So if you want to see more, you can go to the cloud monitor console to see more. Data security, we talk about that, right? The whitelist. Um, oh, sorry, that's two major, uh, there are two important things, SSL and a TDE. SSL is, you can enable our RDS to be able to accept the SSL connection, which the data transmission from the client to the RDS will be encrypted. It is just like the HTTPS features we, um, we, we invoke for the HTTP to make the whole traffic uh, data encrypted. So we can enable SSL for my database. And another requirement is once the data was stored in the RDS, can it be also encrypted? So TDE, transparent data encryption can be enabled from here. And after you enable this, everything you stored in your database is encrypted. Okay, um, I see two, uh, two questions here. Uh, for the no, uh, yeah, for the recovery, there's no very specific answer to the time, but in Alibaba Cloud, if you consider the time for create ECS, create SLB, I would say uh, 10 or 15 minutes should be a very reasonable uh, estimation for the recovery, okay? Um, and um, Maud is asking SS certification type, um, good question. Um, for the certification type, we support uh, usually the PERM, PM, and uh, uh, later on, if I if you need more information, I can find the document to give you the the information. Okay, uh, regarding to the the definitely the PERM is the one we support, and the service availability uh, it is called the HA, right? And uh, this one is also a little bit interesting because oh sorry. 
Let me change to English. Anyway, um, we have three kind of uh, data synchronization way. Remember, let me let me find the English version and turn it to English version. Oh shit! Sorry. So let, let's just keep it here. Um, we have two way, three ways: uh, semi synchronization, uh, I and the uh, async asynchronization and uh, synchronization, right? So because regarding to the HA, we have two nodes, the primary and the secondary. And uh, from the client side, this kind of data replication mode decide how fast the write will return to the client, right? If you consider a uh, asynchronized, um, whatever write to the primary, um, the successful response will return to the client. And the primary database will begin to sync the data to the secondary in a different different process. But if you sync, if you make it the synchronized way, which means if you write data to the primary, the primary will make sure the, the log is transferred to here and the, the log is committed from the second, secondary database, then they will tell the client the write is successful. Okay, now you can see the difference between the different data replication mode. If you want the write faster, you may lose some kind of uh, data synchronization level. But if you want to make sure the data is always synced between the two nodes, you may lose some performance because they need to sync first and response to you second. Okay, so that is something you, you want to also uh, pay attention to. And in the RDS, we have logs, uh, the bin log, error log, slow query log to give you the different uh, view to see what is happening, right? Uh, the bin log is about what has been done in the history so that they can see the exactly uh, operation in the history. The error log is something they not successfully finished. And the slow query is for the performance, right? I remember someone was asking about the performance. So for, from the slow query, you can see which command is kind of slow. So you can maybe focus on that command to do the optimization. but. In Alibaba Cloud, we have another service called the autonomy service embedded in the RDS. This is one is a little bit artificial intelligence based. Then they can do the diagnostic about your system, including the different um, performance related uh, factors. And also they can show you the slow query logs um, and give you some real suggestions. You know, they will suggest to you that maybe this log you can uh, optimize in, in this way. And uh, this one can really save the traditional database administrations work and give you more smart and uh, more insight for the performance tuning. Okay, that is pretty much I want to introduce for RDS because RDS is an important database service for us. So I spend uh, quite a lot of time to, to this. Remember, uh, this is DMS and uh, migration, I've already mentioned about the DTS. So just keep this in mind. DTS can do the data synchronization, data migration. And uh, I think that is uh, the end for the RDS part. Okay. Um, now let's see if uh, you have any questions uh, for the RDS. Can we see list of what query is sleeping, running and queue? Um, Joshua, so maybe I need to spend some time to build an environment like that. So maybe not, not now. And uh, uh, so later on you can, this is my Dean talk ID uh, and you can find my Dean talk in the Malaysia uh, learning group, the tech meet group. So later on we can have some private conversation regarding to the scenarios. Um, if you really want to see some demos, okay. Thanks for your understanding. Um, now let's move back to the another product, OSS. I may start the OSS uh, quickly, then we have another break, then we can uh, have another break. Uh, okay, OSS. And now uh, go back here. And I said, now you know what is the database, right? The database is here, they, they store the data. 
But as I said, you have uh, pictures, videos, documents need to be uh, stored in something else. It's called the OSS. So every ECS, they may think about, I have some special thing, the unstruck data can also be stored from this ECS to the OSS, right? So that will be uh, complete the whole uh, fundamental architect on the cloud, including the computing uh, load balancer and the database storage. Okay. What is the OSS? OSS, let's finish this uh, by doing this kind of comparison. Um, it's called the object storage. But before you understand better about OSS, you need to uh, call back to typical uh, storage type in the IT history. Um, before Alibaba Cloud, I actually worked in, a, in an American company. It's called the, the EMC. I'm not sure how many of you know this company. Uh, EMC, it is a famous uh, top one storage um, uh, device company and now acquired by, by Dell for more than, I don't know, five years, right? Yeah. And uh, the, their traditional and uh, very money making uh, product is block storage product and a file storage product. They have some products like the Claron, Celera, Celera and uh, later on they have something called the unit uh, those kind of device, they provide both block and a file storage. So what exactly is the block storage? Block storage, remember in the ECS, we talk about cloud disk. Cloud disk is a typical block storage because it is a very raw type of storage. It is just like your department, right? You can buy a department without any decoration, without any internal uh, you know, facilitates. It's just an empty space. It's not very user friendly, but it gives you the free ability, uh, the, the freedom to do whatever you want to decorate or want to split on that space, right? So block storage is a storage like that. We give you a bunch of the space and uh, it is your decision to make what kind of things you want to, you know, cl classify and uh, you want to split in the block storage. Remember in the ECS, we give you a cloud disk. That cloud disk is just a space. You cannot use it directly, especially from a human point, humankind point of view. So for ECS, the cloud disk, after you mount it to a ECS, you need to go find the device and then you need to create some partition on it. And from the partition, you may need, still need to do something like the format. Format is to make sure the big space being splitted into the small space, usually it's a four megabyte small space and uh, every space, small space, you give it an index, you give it a location, right? And after you do that, it's called a formatting. You can begin to create something on the top. It's called the file system. Previously, we talked about NFS, right? Or in Linux, we have EXT3. Uh, and in Windows, we have something called the uh, DN, um, NP, NPFS, right? I forgot, I forgot the name. In the Windows, um, uh, you, NTFS, sorry, NTFS. You, these are all the file systems. All the file systems, they create based on your block storage and make it more human being friendly because they design so-called the file system architecture, including the directory, including the files, right? And uh, from human beings point of view, you can organize the data into the file and put the different file in a different directory. And then when you need it, you can always easily find it, right? So that is the idea of the block storage and a file storage. But why we still need something called the object storage? The object storage is coming also from the web service. 
from the internet when the internet is becoming more and more popular. Some web, web host, uh, some, some website hoster, uh, uh, administrator, they found that my website, if I want to demonstrate a page on the browser, they have some strings, the documents, and they have some pictures, right? To show the, uh, maybe the product, uh, you know, the pictures for the product. And uh, also they may have some uh, videos that you can do uh, uh, advertisement, right? All this kind of video, picture, all the strings content. It is not suitable to be organized into a file storage because file storage usually is location-based. You can only visit if you are with the same content in the same server. And even you put it in the NFS, you still need to have some user privilege, uh, some, pri uh, some other mechanisms defined to access those data. This is not very convenient and the website need. The website needs something can be just store and retrieve. Each of the object here, it is very independent. They don't need to know what else, who else is there. They don't care about what else is there. They don't need some architecture, structure, the, the hierarchy, like the file story defined. They only need to care about individually, I can be stored and found whatever and whenever, right? So that is object storage, the backend uh, motivation to build a new kind of storage. In this storage, there's no such kind of file storage architect. There's no so-called the directory. Um, everything is stored and the object. We don't care about uh, the specific type. The file could be an object, video could be an object, the, the music, uh, MP4 could be an object. And I, we give every object a particular ID and this ID, sometimes we call it a key. And this key is global unique, unique, global unique, which means whatever the customer is visiting the website, the website can always return, uh, uh, sorry, the website can always use this unique key to find the object quickly and show it and present to the customer. Okay, so, now you get the idea between the uh, block storage, file storage, and object storage. They are different storage and they have a different purpose. Block is usually for the customer who is very capable to do their own storage management. Usually the database vendors, database providers, they, care, they, they like block storage because they want to have the full control of the very bottom storage. But for the end user, for the individual user through the through the server or the laptop. Uh, we have the file system provided by Microsoft or the Linux. Uh, so the human being can do the file uh, store and the architecture design. But for the website, website owners, they like object storage because they give the flexibility to store something unstructured and also can be accessed uh, globally. Okay. Now you have the idea about uh, the three types of the storage. Uh, we call them the first one, the uh, first two traditional storage, and we call the last one the cloud storage. And, and then we, we will give giving you the more uh, detailed introduction about what it is. Okay. And uh, yeah, EST4, EST4 is also a file storage, right? For Joshua, NTFS. EST4 is from Linux, NTFS is FedCenter. Uh, sorry, Fed32 is from Windows. And Mohit is asking which types of storage suitable for IoT CCTV with IFR um, analytic. Uh, I know IoT and CCTV. Um, so what is FR? Mohit, what is FR? Frequency or something? CCTV is camera. Camera, usually the camera video, we, we suggest you to store also on the OSS, yes. Oh, facial recognition, oh, okay. Yeah, facial recognition is usually based on the pictures and the videos, right? IoT. Um, so 
That is a very good question. Let me answer it uh, quickly. CCTV, video suitable for OSS and the facial recognition on um, the back end is still, still pictures. So it should be in the OSS. And IoT, I, IoT, we have a typical database called the time sequential database, TS database. That one will be suitable for the IoT, especially for the sensor generated time-based uh, data, okay? Uh, to answer my hard question. Now it is 11.20, uh, let's take a 10 minutes break and I will continue with the OSS introduction and the demo. And hopefully uh, uh, we can cover all the content uh, in the next one hour. Okay, let's take a 10 minutes break. <laughs> 